So, um, could I ask you to introduce yourselves? Um, just so uh, your name, position, the organisation, and so on, so that um, other people looking at the recordings know who you are. Um, and also, I would like to know if any of you have a conflict of interest. We need to know that as well. So, should we start from the same? Uh, thank thank Mr. you. Mr. Rudkin. Yes. My name is Duncan Rudkin. I'm the Chief Executive of the General Pharmaceutical Council. We are the statutory independent regulator for the pharmacy profession and retail pharmacy in Great Britain. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Phil Martin, I'm the Assistant Director for Education Policy at the General Medical Council, so my brief covers uh, education matters related to doctors and the GMC's responsibilities in those. Thank you very much. My name is John Smythe, I'm the Assistant Director for uh, the Case Examiner team in the Fitness Sorry, team. can you speak up a bit? <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. I'm John Smythe, I'm the Assistant Director for Fitness to Practice uh, with responsibility for the Case Examiner team and my team makes decisions at the end of initial fitness to practice investigations. I should say my background is as a general practitioner. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest that I'm aware of. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so what we're doing this afternoon is to focus on adverse events and the complaint handling of those uh, events. So I'd like to start off just by asking the GMC and the Minister side who's going to answer this. Um, in your evidence that you've sent us, and thank you very much for that, um, you're saying that practitioners must report concerns relating to address events or prescribing patterns in the case of the pharmaceutical um, uh, uh, regulator. Um, and I just wonder if you could tell us whether you feel that um, this requirement should really become mandatory to for and how would that work? And one of the suggestions we've been given is that in order to get it mandated, it would form part of the appraisal process uh, of clinicians. So perhaps you've got some thoughts on that. It's certainly in the guidance already that they're expected to um, report adverse incidents in relation to prescribing. Um, making it mandatory, um, I suppose, is one option. The question for me in terms of appraisal would be how would that be um, reported? Um, would you expect the doctors to report it themselves, which they are expected to do anyway? And how would you know if they had reported all incidents that they'd been made aware of? It, similarly, I suppose, with the current system, it relies on doctors to report all incidents that they're aware of. Um, the suggestion might be that not all incidents are actually reported currently. So those would come to the Fitness to Practice Committee, would it? Or? Um, just to emphasise, I think um, in, in terms of our own remit, um, obviously our interest is in the fitness to practice of individual doctors. And uh, we take action in respect of serious or uh, recurrent concerns about doctors. A one-off incident in relation to a doctor may not necessarily result in action being taken or in fact it meeting the threshold for us to open an investigation because an individual incident may not raise a fitness practice concern about that doctor. So I think it would depend on the context of the incident and what the um, reporting ought to have been, what the consequences are brought to the doctor's attention as to whether that would ever reach that threshold. So something like the review into Dr. Patterson and that is happening, is that something the GMC could have done or did it require um, a bishop to chair it and to uh, do the review? I can't really speak knowledgeably about the Patterson inquiry, that's not something I'm directly involved in. Sorry, what? I can't really speak knowledgeably about no. the Patterson inquiry, no. that's not something I'm directly involved in. No. I, I was just trying to test out how far the GMC can take up issues and how much you feel you have to refer on. We, we, we do take up issues of, um, that are brought to our attention or that we become aware of through um, either patient complaints or concerns of a recurrent nature, um, but it's not necessarily the function of my team to, to take those things forward, so I, I don't really feel I can comment knowledge beyond that. I don't know whether you'd like to say anything about that. Um, 
I, I, I don't think there's much additionally to say. Obviously, don't particularly want to talk about the case, but it sounds as though this relates to the thresholds that you're that you're referring to, and I think there'll always be a debate about the exact threshold. But certainly, what we try to do is get involved where we where we become aware of there being serious fitness to practice or there being a suspicion of serious fitness to practice issues rather than um, necessarily and, and the judgment on the threshold for that is, is taken on a case by case basis mm. but isn't that one of the problems really I mean you know, here you are you have the guidance which says doctors should be making up adverse event reports and they should be doing that consistently I can hear that you know obviously if it's one example that you found out that they didn't report that would hardly go very far but I mean if you're wanting to make sure that the guidance around standards of practice for GPs and doctor doctors is being followed, you have to have a way of testing that, don't you? Otherwise, the guidance really is without teeth. And so this issue about whether it can be picked up in appraisal, so would you expect a doctor every time he's reported or made that person then report to have recorded it somewhere so that whoever's appraising them would be able to see a record of these constant reports? I mean, it's sort of slightly worrying, isn't it? But, you know, here it is, it's in the guidance, but we don't really know whether they're doing it and... Well, the guidance is there to inform doctors, obviously. It's there to guide them about what they should do in individual circumstances. But because it's in the guidance, and if they don't always follow the guidance, that doesn't necessarily reach that threshold for taking action on someone's registration, which is Mm -hmm. the blunt tool that we have to take action. And obviously, what you're talking about is, should doctors report every single incident of concern in relation to medication side effects uh, or expected effects? Yes, they should. Do they in practice? I don't know. Um, Obviously, um, we are far removed from the clinical environment. The GMC isn't sitting looking over every individual doctor's shoulder when they're in the consulting room or surgery. Um, So, you know, there may be a a gap in terms of what's reported and, and what we're made aware of. I think there are possibly two issues here, one of which is the way in which our guidance operates, which which tries to reflect the fact that there that there are um, a variety of different cases and that um, that we're not there on the front line. So we try and set principles so that people should. There's also the question of whether if we were to change that to are mandated to, firstly whether that's in our within our gift to do which I'm afraid I'm not an expert on the topic so I can't speak to but the second of which is if that were to happen would that substantially change the the yeah. extent to which people report and again I think that that's much more likely to happen because of action taken by employers at a much closer level than it is as a result of um, the GMC's particular guidance to that because I think we've been reasonably clear that our expectation would be in the event of an adverse uh, event then we would expect people to note and report it. So you would be inclined to say you'd be shifting responsibility from the individual to the organisation? Uh, I wouldn't say shifting responsibility, I'm, I'm thinking about the the practicality, the practicality of how, of, of what from a position that we sit in within the system we can, we can affect. So would that be in a way similar to the duty of candor that's effectively an organisational duty that applies to individuals within an organisation? Well, it is an individual expectation as well. Yes, it is, absolutely. But that's what I'm saying. Would would there be a parallel there if you put adverse event reporting onto an organisational level? I I, I think that duty of candor exists anyway um, Mm -hmm. in respect of individual doctors and organisations. Um, but can we can we say categorically, given our distance from clinical practice in terms of the actual day-to-day delivery of that, that everybody is candid in every situation? Yeah. I don't think we can say that. Mm. Right. Um, can I just ask the pharmaceutical um, council, can I ask you, um, we have been very concerned and we've heard a lot from uh, women who have given birth to children as uh, a consequence of Valparate. They've been obviously epileptic women and their uh, offspring have been very seriously damaged. And one of the things that we really have been trying very hard to do is to ensure that pregnant women are aware of the risks if they're 
are suffering from epilepsy and they are still being prescribed and dispensed epilin or one of the other drugs. Uh, can you tell me where is your role in all of that as a council? So <clears throat> I think uh, I would first of all want to say we very much share your concern that women and girls should receive the right advice uh, and information, both um, in terms of conversations with prescribers uh, and also pharmacy and pharmacists have a key role to play as part of the safety chain at the point of supply, making sure that the right information and, and guidance is provided, that uh, uh, s- appropriate, useful and sensitive and thoughtful questions are asked to encourage women and girls to access the right information. So when we um, were contacted by the MHRA uh, in the second half of last year about this and asked to uh, work with them uh, and others on the topic, it was something that we felt uh, was very important and that we should be very engaged with. So um, I think there are a number of ways in which we're involved. One is in terms of the standards we set for pharmacy professionals, pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, which make it very make very clear the importance of person-centred care as part of professionalism, uh, with an emphasis on, uh, I think, dialogue, on making sure that patients have the right information. So there's a, the setting of standards side of what we do, which is obviously directly relevant to this. But like the GMC, we don't produce guidance on specific medicines um, but we will from time to time, and this was an example, this is an example where because of the nature of, significant nature of the risk and public concern, we felt that uh, notwithstanding it's not a, not a topic on which we as a body have a, a role in relation to the medicine as such, but it was important for us to use our communication channels to the profession and to the pharmacy sector to support messaging from the MHRA and others in relation to uh, safety information. Uh, so we've done and continue to do proactively a number of uh, messaging uh, opportunities through our uh, contacts with all pharmacists on the register, uh, through emails, through our newsletter to them. Um, and also because we have uh, slightly differently from some of the other professional regulators in relation to retail pharmacy, we also have. Uh, the responsibility for setting standards for the owners of pharmacies and uh, we inspect those pharmacies, the retail pharmacies. Uh, We're also able on the ground to uh, play a part, uh, not in uh, audit, which is not something we do, but in terms of uh, using inspection as a tool to raise awareness and for us to ask questions. So, For example, we, uh, in the course of last year, added into our routine for our inspectors uh, uh, a specific line of questioning, line of inquiry around Valparaid as part of our assessment of whether the standards in relation to medication safety are being met in those pharmacies. Um, So there are a number of things we can do, both in terms of standards for, for owners, standards for professionals, and very importantly, communications. I think with all of those, with all of these um, interventions, if you like, it's a case of trying to find the find and use the right levers at the right moments in the right way. Um, uh, And there's always more that we can and should be thinking about doing in relation to that. Having done the inspection last year around compliance, presumably with the PPP, what did you find? Well, we've uh, because of the way our inspections work and we're covering a very significant range of issues in, an, in a relatively short space of time with an inspection. We don't uh, necessarily have uh, very detailed data on compliance. It is a snapshot. Um, we're finding a mixed picture I think is, is, the, is the honest answer. I think there's a high level of awareness of what should happen. There isn't necessarily always that confidence that it is happening. Um, but I think the way in which one of the ways in which we operate is through using inspection to ask questions and um, uh, focus attention on issues. So we're raising the profile of the issue within the profession and the sector as well. 
we have some evidence that um, there are uh, specific concerns about a number of cases. We've got a small number, uh, single figures, of cases that we are at early stages of investigating uh, where there are specifics that are potentially subject to our due process, actionable in terms of the fitness to practice process. And that's a proportion. What would that be of the total that you looked at? So in the course of a year, we'd inspect around, probably around four, four and a half thousand pharmacies. Uh, the, the particular focus on Valpro, it started during the course of the autumn of last year, so it is still relatively, for us anyway, in relation to specifically targeting that issue uh, relatively early. And have that handful of um, cases that you think might be actionable, did they all come from your inspections no. or did they come from spontaneous reports or where did they originate? Uh, We've had uh, a number of matters referred to us uh, via the MHRA that originate through with members of INFACT. Can can I ask you, um, I should know this, and I'm afraid I don't, but with the um, community pharmacist, how much information does that person or the people working in that uh, facility, how much information do they get from the GP? I mean, would they get a register of women who are epileptic and who are of childbearing age? So I don't believe that they would have a register. So, um, that, and I think, it is, I think it's true to say that it's, it's variable, uh, that... Uh, in the patient medication record, if that patient has used that pharmacy before, uh, which wouldn't be unusual for a repeat prescription, obviously, uh, then if there's a medication there in the, in the pharmacy's record that is evidently a, an, a, an epilepsy medicine and the woman is of childbearing age, or might be, then the, the pharmacy is on notice, effectively, that uh, there is an issue there that they ought to be exploring if Valproate is, is if a prescription allows Valproate. Um, the pharmacies, generally speaking, um, in the community don't have full access to patient records. It is a patient safety issue, undoubtedly. Uh, uh, it's been there's been some progress made with access to the summary care record. Um, uh, there are, of course, uh, then rules about how that's uh, access in the pharmacy and the patient's consent is required for that on each, on each occasion. So there are a number of ways in which the pharmacy might be aware and the pharmacist might be aware that there, there is or could be uh, a safety issue in relation to Velcro. But I think we've been um, very clear with them that um, on the basis of the information and advice we've had uh, from and through the MHRA, that wherever say the Valparate is being supplied to a, a, a woman who might be of childbearing age, then there needs to be uh, an appropriate conversation, discussion. Um, so I think, I think you're right to highlight access to records in community pharmacy as an, as an area of potential risk if, if the access is limited, and it is in many cases, and the, as, a, as a, a much wider issue, of course, about how um, pharmacy could uh, uh, add more value at the point of supply with uh, across a range of safety uh, issues, but also in terms of value added on public health and so on, with with greater access to uh, to to records in an integrated way. Yes. I think I think we we absolutely get the uh, the patient safety point you make in relation to access to to medical record of, of the patient uh, I suppose I think what you're saying is that if a patient presents in a pharmacy with a prescription for Valparate whether or not that patient is a regular user of that particular pharmacy if that patient is a woman and between you know of childbearing age the pharmacist in your view I'm putting words in your mouth here, the pharmacist in your view should have that appropriate conversation in an appropriate manner is that right absolutely so he or she the pharmacist does not need any further information because it's, the evidence is in front of them. Yeah. So the other thing, sorry, please go. Sorry, the other thing that you you mentioned this handful of potential FTP cases um, that have come your way, as it were, 
via MHRA and INFAD. Um, it's interesting. You're, so you're saying that they may well end up, they may or they may not end up as FTP cases, but it is possible that they will. Yes. Is there a situation from a GMC perspective in which something similar could happen? So it would depend on the individual circumstances of the case, and that's not to avoid your question, but obviously if somebody were to prescribe whatever drug it might be inappropriately, ignoring safety concerns about that drug, um, being well aware of the risks of prescribing that drug in a particular situation and ignoring the guidance, then that might raise a concern about somebody's fitness to practice. But I'll come back to what I said earlier on, which is uh, an error made on an individual uh, basis in, in one circumstance that isn't associated with more widespread concerns may not meet that threshold to take action on somebody's registration. So it, it, it really depends on the context in which you're, you're trying to put this. So um, we're talking about Valprate, which is what we've been talking about. A doctor who makes a mistake on one day to prescribe a drug, um, it may not meet that threshold. If the doctor repeatedly fails to follow the guidance and prescribes Valprate or, an, or a similar drug with similar dangers, repeatedly over a period of time, ignoring the guidance that was appropriately available to them, then that would raise a concern mm. in my view. But I'm not sure, I, I'm sure Mr Rudkin can't go into detail here, but, but are we talking about cases where there's been a persistent failure, or are we talking about cases where a pharmacist has done something on one occasion which has come to your attention and may end up as an FTP case? I, I can't give you that level of, level of detail, I'm afraid, but what I would say, um, it, it's equally true in pharmacy, of course, as with all the uh, statutory regulated professions, including the medical profession, that what, whether a case amounts to a fitness to practice case with action at the end of the process or not is very fact specific, very context specific, uh, and will depend on the on the seriousness, the you know the the context, the, whether there's kind of repeated and aggravating factors, and that that's true of, of certainly of, of both of these professions. Um, it seems to me the where we have we've got this. Um, because we've got, uh, through the inspections that we carry out, an opportunity to look at systems and processes in, in the pharmacy that we don't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have access to through a fitness to practice procedure that's only looking at individuals. Uh, it does mean that we can ask questions and look for evidence about the, what the practice is in the, in, the, in the practice. It doesn't necessarily tell you, of course, that that's always followed. And that's, so there's the difference there between what the, you know what the standard operating procedures say. Uh, it can be different, of course, from what actually happens on a particular afternoon. Of course, and we're, all of us, I'm sure, are united in the fact that we don't want to see any more children disabled through these sort of practices. Can I ask you, and particularly I think you're a general practitioner, is that right? C can I ask you on your systems, and we know that um, a lot of general practice now has adopted uh, information systems that rely on technology and things like that, make it perhaps more simple. There is, I believe, an alert is that, that comes up if a woman is taking Valprate and she's of childbearing age. Is that right? So one of the problems in general practice is that there are different clinical systems in operation between different practices. Um, I, I'm not currently in practice, so I can't speak about what's happened since the concerns were elevated about the use of Valparate. But in relation to other medicines where there are known concerns, if you attempt to prescribe something, you will get a series of warnings that you have to uh, actively click to remove in order to continue to prescribe a particular medication. So I can't speak with knowledge about what happens in this case of Valparate at the moment, um, but it may well be that the um, systems have been altered to uh, include a particular warning in respect of women of childbearing age, and I'm sure you, your inquiries will lead you to, to whether or not that's the case or not. So you're saying some practices wouldn't have that facility? I'm not saying that. I think most practices now um, use electronic prescribing systems there may be uh, individual circumstances in which people still issue handwritten prescriptions, but the majority <coughs> of prescriptions and repeat prescriptions are done through electronic prescribing systems, which do have the alerts that you're talking about on. Do you know how many systems are in play? Um, 
I don't. Now, um, certainly they've started to reduce the number of systems because uh, some of the old systems have been gradually eased out. So uh, system one is one of the systems that's now used in a lot of general practices. EMIS, I think, is still going. Vision, I think, is, is kind of under pressure, as it were. But the, there's no, been no unified system across the whole of primary care since uh, computers were introduced in the mid-90s, I suppose, more in general. And I think the same is true in the case of pharmacists, that, that there is a, an alert or flash on the screen for the, in the pharmacy, assuming it's all electronic, obviously, that, that pharmacists will see an alert related to a particular medicine. Is that right? In fact, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. So. I think we've, we've been told that that's the case. But one of the, the points I would, the other, one of the other things that we've been told is, is that there's a sort of culture of alert fatigue. There are so many alerts that there's a tendency to not necessarily pay as much attention to them as I, I think got that's, any experience of that? that's entirely possible. Um, I can't speak for, for the people that you've spoken to already and what their view is, but my own experience of um, using uh, websites that flash things up that say, you know, do you want to proceed? People don't read them quite as carefully as they ought to, in respect of actually working as a doctor in primary care prescribing drugs that can cause very serious consequences, I would expect them to read them very carefully before clicking oh. off them. Um, whether that happens in practice, your experience and your conversation suggests not. I think the possibility of alert fatigue is something that's very, been very much in our, in, in our minds in relation, for, for example, uh, to our recent proactive communications around Sophie Belpre. Um, I don't know that there's evidence that, that alert fatigue is a, is a real phenomenon, a real uh, risk. But I think it's quite like it's not an unlikely scenario, it seems to me, and it, I think it did come up in a in a way in the Care Quality Commission report on the safety culture that we saw a few weeks ago, um, where the the issue of organisations with with good intentions, uh, for very understandable reasons, feeling the need to send out alerts on a range of different topics. But sometimes that must feel to practitioners, both pharmacists and others maybe, that that's you know, a sort of tsunami of stuff coming at them from a load of different people. Um, and then I think when we're thinking about sending out yet another message, we have to think, I think it's incumbent on us all to think, for example, are we doing this because we can give more work and help, or are we doing it so that we can say we have? You know, it's really important that we are all work in the most effective way uh, to get the right information to people. So, hence my, my comment earlier about using all of the different tools, thinking about direct communications, different channels through um, the owners and people responsible for governance in, these, in the, our healthcare organisations, as well as the individual professionals and their teams. One of the things that we do when we're inspecting pharmacies is speak to the non the, the non-registered staff, the counter assistants, for example, who play an important part in face-to-face -face communication and are often, of course, on a practical level, involved in handing out medication to patients. Uh, and they, we know anecdotally <coughs> what a powerful role they can play when they're properly trained and empowered in the right culture in a, in a pharmacy, for example, to actually play a key part in, in safety, both in terms of that immediate transaction, but also in terms of spotting opportunities to tie up systems and things like that. So I think it's important we, we're trying to communicate with everybody involved, not only the, the pharmacist, for example, in, in my case. Do you, do, do you ever interview the users of the service? When we are uh, on an inspection, we are very... Um, we're very mindful of the, f of the risk that we get in the way of service being provided and most people visiting a pharmacy, if they're there when, we, when our inspector happens to be there, wanting their transaction and, and they want to you know, get on with their work, we observe, so we, what we do at the moment is we observe practice, so we stand, literally stand in the corner and see, watch what's happening um, and we ask the pharmacy as part of the standards uh, to uh, collect uh, customer and patient feedback. We don't ourselves at the moment directly collect uh, user feedback. So, um, 
20 years ago when I was an elected member of the General Medical Council and responsible through the Standards Committee for Good Medical Practice, I used to think that uh, one of our roles was to protect and improve trust in the profession, which is I think the third statutory duty. And that basically that was about regulation was about contract and it was about conscience and the GMC was the conscience of the profession. Now going around the country we've heard from patients stories which have called into question the trust these patients have in the doctors who've looked after them and some of the stories have been horrifying. So I found myself asking whether the profession, I'm no longer on the register, I've retired, is doing as much as it should be doing to be trustworthy. <coughs> and uh, one of the things they particularly mentioned is conflict of interest. Um, it isn't, it, I know it has been proposed in the past, and I think you've consulted on whether or not the General Medical Council should maintain a register of conflict of interest. Can you tell me about how that went and why you decided not to do it? I, I'm not aware personally. Um, I'm afraid that I, yeah, I am also point. don't, but we can provide information. We can take it away and provide information. Who in the General Medical Council should we speak to to answer that question? The Chief Executive? Uh, I would need to find out who was working on that review. I apologise, I joined six months ago, so it probably predates my time in the GMC, but I will take it away and find a name and provide it to the Secretary. Uh, because certainly good medical practice used to be very clear about declaring a conflict of interest, that if you had one, you had to declare it to the patient. And it still does make reference to conflicts of interest. Well, you raised the question. It's always been a problem for the General Medical Council. As you say, good medical practice is guidance. How do you know it's being followed? If you don't follow it and a complaint is made, then you have to justify why you didn't follow it. Otherwise, your fitness practice may be called into question. But if there is something which is fundamentally going wrong, and this is what we've heard about conflict of interest, then surely you ought to consider whether or not you should be doing more to be trustworthy. So I, I would counter what you've said by saying um, our experience is that those people who have had um, bad experiences where things have not gone well do have a particular view about the trustworthiness of those that they've been involved in their care. Um, my, my personal view and my view from my experience of working in the GMC for some years now is that we see a very small proportion of doctors who are actually on the register. There are over a quarter of a million doctors on the register and uh, in the course of a year we, we won't, certainly won't see complaints about all of those. It's a tiny fraction of those that we actually see complaints about. So my position would be that there is a lot of trust still and all of these surveys that are done suggest there remains trust medicine is one of the most trusted professions amongst all of the professions, that's not to underestimate the devastating effect that individuals may feel, uh, the loss of trust they feel when things <coughs> don't go well. In respect of conflicts of interest, um, in what context has it come up in those oh, conversations? Uh, that uh, medicine, this goes back some time ago, when Primados was uh, given out, it wasn't prescribed, it was given out by doctors, but they were free samples and they, there, was, there was no mention of risk, but then there wasn't a risk but that they knew of at the time. But there was the notion that this was a sample which had been given and it was part of marketing. That's what we've been told. That was an issue. There's an issue over surgical devices as to whether or not uh, there was a conflict of interest because they were being provided with uh, the device uh, uh, by the manufacturer. All these things, if, if it was a register or it was part, say, of appraisal that you had to declare a conflict of interest, the ways of dealing with it would actually be something which would serve to improve trust. 
as a researcher now, you always declare any conflict of interest before you give a presentation. It's just routine. So shouldn't the GMC consider that as being an appropriate action uh, in relation to, uh, well, we know about hospitality, but in the use of devices? I think, as my colleagues say, we're not really well prepared to actually respond to that question, but we can certainly speak to those that were involved in considering And maybe that. you could then give us a response. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Right. Anything else? One of the... Sorry. Oh, yes. So, ju just in relation to conflicts of interest, mm. um, uh, I was involved uh, over the course of a couple of years, from time to time, in some really useful work that was done by NHS England under the leadership of Sir Malcolm Grant are on conflict, conflicts of interest particularly um, and I, uh, I know that um, GMC colleagues uh, and a range of others have been very engaged in that, in that work uh, and produced guidance for the NHS in England uh, and there's a, there's a renewed focus now the guidance having been produced on uh, implementation and on evidence of compliance with that with that guidance. So uh, there has been, a, a, I think, quite a lot of progress on that front uh, in that way. Albeit, um, you know, there's more to do in terms of monitoring and securing assurance that the guidance is being followed. It has, of course, also been uh, uh, continues to be in different ways a significant issue for pharmacists for obvious reasons in relation to um, mm. to, to conflicts. Mm. And do you keep a register? We don't, no. Uh, I think we, um, it's not something that we've specifically looked at or been asked to consider, but I think if we were, I think we'd be asking whether that was the most, if, the question for me would be, is that the most effective way mm. of actually doing, doing, securing the right outcome? We've, in our guidance, in our standards, which is compulsory, I would say, for all, all of our registrants, got clear statements about the need to declare and manage conflicts of interest mm. appropriately. Um, making that stick in reality and then being able to demonstrate that that's working is, is obviously a slightly there, different There is a, different a sort of privately run website run by a general practitioner, uh, <coughs> a, a registrar who pays this dot to dot all uh, available. So there are some doctors who uh, are taking action in this area, but uh, I'm really raising the more general question as to whether it should be part of the appraisal to recognise your responsibility in this area, because it's, it's set out in the guidance, or it was very clearly set out in, in my time. We've been um, supportive of, and again used our communications uh, on occasions to, to encourage members of the pharmacy profession to engage with Disclosure UK, which is the, the register uh, that I think has been set up essentially uh, uh, by or with the support of the pharmaceutical industry to, uh, as a voluntary, but nevertheless quite powerful tool to provide a, for, a forum publicly for uh, various health professionals to, uh, to um, declare their interests. Mm. And that's that, um, been, been very much on the agenda as part of that NHS England work as well. Thank you very much. Can, can I just ask you on conflicts of interest? Um, we're seeing a growth now about GPs dispensing as well as prescribing. Do you see that there is a conflict of interest in that activity? Uh, I probably should say, uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for taking a sort of um, technical point, that the um, regulation of the medical profession is, is not a matter for me to comment on. It's, it's also true that there are pharmacists who are prescribers um, and uh, we are working on some guidance ourselves for pharmacist prescribers. In that context, the, I suspect we will find, subject to consultation, that, that we may well be reluctant to impose an absolute ban, as it were, that it should be unusual, that it shouldn't be the norm from a, in pharmacy for the prescriber to also be making the supply. There may be occasions when actually for practical reasons what the patient needs at that moment is actually that supply to be made and that's probably, I suspect, where we would, where we would end up on that, on that topic. C can I ask the GMC the same question? Um, 
So the, the responsibilities of doctors in prescribing medicines are set out in the guidance in terms of being sure they have enough information to prescribe safely, making sure that you've made an appropriate assessment of the need for it, explaining the um, consequences of prescribing, not prescribing, all of that set out. So um, if doctors are in businesses that have pharmacies within them, as long as the doctors are meeting their requirements under the medical practice to prescribe appropriately, the dispensing of that medication is subject to regulation by the Pharmaceutical Council. Doctors themselves personally aren't normally prescribing those, aren't normally dispensing those medicines, but there may be dispensers within their premises. Is there a conflict of interest in that? Um, I suppose like any business that has overlapping interest, there's a potential for that to be there. Do we have evidence that that's the case? No. And the only other thing to note on that is that our consent guidance talks about how doctors prescribing any sort of um, of treatment, um, whether that's uh, whether that's something pharmaceutical or otherwise, we have guidance for how they should discuss that with patients to make sure that they are aware of both the potential benefits and the potential risks involved, and to give them the information they require to come to an informed decision around consent to that. In terms of consent, one of the things that struck me from the evidence that you submitted is quite how low the number of concerns that have been raised about informed consent are, given that we have been hearing from an awful lot of women who have been saying that their surgery, they weren't properly informed, it wasn't fully informed consent, and you're dealing with 175 inquiries in 2018, which seems a very, very small number. We were very surprised by that. Not all of them would come to, not all concerns around that would necessarily escalate to the GMC. <coughs> right in that. No, and it, it, it perhaps um, raises an issue around um, perceptions of consent. So very often allegations about uh, inadequate consent or lack of consent are raised with the council uh, when we do our preliminary investigations. Um, and it transpires that there is a clearly documented consent process within the medical records. Now the patient's individual recollection of that consent process may be very different to what's documented in the records, but in terms of evidential proof, it's actually very difficult to get to any allegation that might relate yeah. to that matter. So when you sort of submitted evidence to us and you said you had 175 inquiries related to informed consent? Yeah, maybe just that that was the only issue in that particular case. I'm not, I'm not quite clear on how those statistics were, were generated. So sorry, does an inquiry mean it's a complaint that's established or it's, does it just it's, mean it's the first off, I, I want yes. to talk to you about how I had it, it's a, it's a, a, a complaint that comes to the council to consider whether or not to open an investigation. So it is already a complaint, not just an inquiry? It it's a it's at the inquiry stage. If it's, el if it's uh, promoted to an investigation, that's the terminology that we use. So those are your sort of first stage yes. complaint handling coming into you, and then they're promoted to the second stage, which yes. is investigation. Okay. Are you surprised by the numbers? Um, as I say, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure whether that's that was the only allegation in those matters, or whether it was <coughs> the. There are others that included other allegations as well. I'm not quite sure how that data has been cut. I'm afraid. Because I know earlier you said what a quarter of a million doctors on the register. Yes and that there's a small number of complaints about a small number of those. I mean, do you pick up trends from your complaints? I mean, how do you analyse complaints? You know, what, what information do you draw out of them? Is there anything that you've been looking at in terms of complaints over a number of years that lead you to think there may be something amiss here? Or are they so low that you don't feel you've got a, a handle on this? So, that's quite a difficult question to answer because we have a very a wide range of different allegations that are brought to our attention about um, all aspects of medical practice, not just primary care but secondary care in all its many forms. So actually condensing that into there is a significant concern about this individual thing is quite difficult when you think about the number of encounters that we would never hear about. So in terms of recognising trends, I think that's quite difficult and this relates a little to, to what we're discussing today in the sense of what could we do to identify trends. Given that we're at the very end of the process where it may well be there's been a local investigation first into a complaint that's been made, 
um, those complaints may have been resolved satisfactorily between the individual parties and never brought to our attention. If we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg of, of things that are out there, or if we are seeing um, all of the things that are out there, we, we can't say for sure. Um, but given the small numbers that we're looking at in the overall scheme of what's out there, it's actually difficult to identify trends. I suppose it comes back to whether it's a proactive process here or very much reactive. Sound, but it's very much reactive. Um, I think we, we work in collaboration with others and certainly when uh, in, in issues are raised with us about concerns that others have, we can start to look at those things more closely. Um, if we notice trends ourselves amongst um, particular types of complaint, we speak to other people as well about those things. But, that, but you say that hasn't been happening? Actually, been noticing any particular. Uh, you're asking me specifically about consent. That's well, not I mean, consent is just one aspect. We're just looking more broadly at what complaints tells you, really. So we, we have been working with other regulators recently around uh, matters of uh, prescribing in other areas, um, in the online environment, etc., as well. And that's certainly something that we're working working hard with other regulators to try and identify trends and think about what we need to do to address those concerns that are out there. Are you picking up anything um, in regard to the manner of consultation between the doctor and the patient? In, in what regard? Well, we hear, um, and obviously you must understand where we start from, but we hear quite a lot of stories of, of women who have had uh, consultations with their doctors which have frankly have been less than helpful and have been probably downright dismissive of many of the women whose cases have come before these doctors and I'm just wondering, you know, they are very vocal to us, I just wonder whether they're making those complaints to you. And you won't be surprised to, to hear that we also hear those kinds of stories. Um, obviously our approach is, is not to say that one person is right and another person is wrong and there are definitely two versions of every encounter that takes place. So our view is to try and get to the truth if we can of those matters those types of situations are actually very difficult to bottom out sometimes because there are, if there's no independent party present during a consultation, you can't really take one person's word over another's regardless of how strongly you might feel on a personal level about um, what has been said by one party or another. Are they on the increase, those sort of complaints? Um, I, I don't have any statistics, but certainly um, from my own experience of looking at cases, they're, they're no more prevalent now than they were some years ago. If, 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 as you say, it's one person's word against another and you know, there's no one else in the room, obviously that's usually often the case. Um, how, how, does, how does complaint of that nature get treated then? How do you resolve it? So it, it would really depend on whether evidence could ever be adduced that would support one version or the other. Um, it also depends what other allegations would be present in that case. So it's often not just about the doctor was rude to me or the doctor didn't consent me properly, there will be some other aspect of an encounter that would cause concern for the individual as well, and that then might escalate the level of concern. And as I said at the very beginning, serious concerns or persistent concerns are the things that on which we can take action as a regulator. I, we've said, as, you, as you may know, we've, we've travelled around the country and we've been to, I don't know, rather lost count of how many places we've been to, a lot of places, um, and in some of them we've sat and listened to patients who've talked to us about an individual doctor or a couple of individual doctors and those patients haven't, as far as we know, compared notes before coming to see us but an individual's name gets mentioned to, to us in the context of what the secretary here has described as dismissive, passive-aggressive, egotistical behaviour. Um, so it's not one individual case. I mean, these are, all, these are anecdotal. We're not taking sides in the sense that we can't <coughs> prove who's right and who's wrong here. We weren't in the room either. But it does strike us when we hear things like that, that it, you know, hearing a number of people talk about an individual doctor would suggest that there's a problem. And it goes back to what I said before, serious or persistent concerns mm -hmm. about an individual doctor are things that we can take an act action on. So if the GMC was made aware about persistent multiple concerns about an individual doctor, that might be something we could take action on. Can I ask in relation to consent, given Montgomery and the, the increasing requirement of the consent process, is the council considering giving advice to the profession about recording and audio recording of consent as opposed to just making a note in the notes? I 
I'm not aware. Of, uh, uh, I've not. I've, I've not heard that specific suggestion. Although I should say that it's um, a colleague elsewhere in my director who's leading. We are currently reviewing the consent guidance, um, and I think uh, we will be picking up different views on this. It's um, uh, as part of that consultation, so, as well as responding to what, if anything, you think is appropriate to be done about recording conflicts. Would you also let us know? what you're doing in relation to consent. Yes, we can send that. Thank you. Can I just ask a slightly broader question in a way? Fitness to practice investigations are about individuals or individual pharmacies. How do you then take the lessons from those and embed them in a system like where? Or do you? So, um, individual fitness to practice uh, decisions that are made uh, where actions taken on the doctor's registration are published. Um, they're on, available on the uh, register for people to access. Um, so that's one way in which they're published. Um, so we, for example, we report regularly to our council in our published council papers on uh, what's happening with our caseload. Uh, and although our uh, the detail uh, isn't necessarily um, always there in, 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 at every level that one would want. One can nevertheless see over time, uh, in a perhaps not necessarily very scientific way, um, some trends and, and things which front lines of inquiry. So um, what we do with those, for example, would be to say, well, is, is there something there that we ought to be monitoring a bit more closely? Uh, one of those, for a good example that's very topical, is uh, workplace pressures. And of course, that's an issue in itself in terms of safety, potentially, but also as, a, as an important part of context, could, could lie behind some of the reasons why, for example, good practice isn't necessarily always followed if people are feeling, for whatever reason, that they don't have time, and I wouldn't necessarily accept that concept, but there you go, to do the right thing. Uh, so our council identified uh, during the course of last uh, year that we'd started to notice a small, and our numbers are very small, but nevertheless a small increase in the number of uh, pharmacies that were not uh, meeting the standards in relation to safe staffing. So one of the ways in which we can deal with something like that is, is to uh, track it more closely, to then to use that insight uh, uh, quite organically in a way to then uh, inform our communications activity to inform things like um, uh, targeted communications and expectations on the profession in terms of um, reflection so for the first time this year as part of the implementation of a form of revalidation in pharmacy we'll be asking uh, our registrants to submit to us a record of a uh, an account where they've reflected on something in relation to their practice and a discussion with a peer um, that's informed their practice and we would use things like what's appearing in the caseload uh, and where are the standards not being met to inform the selection of the standards that we would ask people to reflect on which then gives it a sort of focus for communication and then encourages others in the sector education providers, people responsible for journals and so on, and as well the owners of the businesses to then target activity on those, in those areas. So it's quite an organic mm -hmm. and not necessarily very scientific process, but it is starting to sort of, uh, you can start to see the flow a little bit through issues. And I think the, the other point on this is that fitness practices and, and inquiries are a source of information about what might be going on out there. I think for the reasons that John's outlined, they're not necessarily the best source, just because the numbers make them make them difficult to assess trends on the basis of, of very small numbers in a lot of cases. But they can be an indicator of an area where we'd want to where we might need more guidance, where we might want to push attention. There are lots of other sources for that, things like the National Training Survey, things like the groups that we're involved in with other regulators. That, so it's one source amongst many of where we might want to focus attention and think there might be issues that are coming up. Right. Um, 
can I just ask Gabbard, because I think we need to wind up. But uh, Valerie, if you have any more questions? I just want to ask about your inspection reports. Are they made public? Well, that's a very good and topical question. Uh, they're not currently published. Can we have one? Uh, we, uh, for the first uh, few years of our existence, were uh, unfortunately in the position where we didn't have the legal power to publish our inspection reports, which of course is a very undesirable position for a regulator to be in. That was, that was remedied uh, uh, during the course of last year with the commencement of a new power, and we have consulted uh, the public and the profession on the use of that. We've recently made a set of decisions, including confirming the decision that all the reports should routinely be published. Uh, and we will, uh, over the course of the uh, first half of this year, be uh, rolling that out. So it's a, it's a very topical question. And I think that the potential for publication of pharmacy inspection reports to raise the profile and also raise expectations, which I think is, is if I may, Baroness, a point that I just wanted to, uh, to offer into the discussion. Uh, it comes back to the question, about, the question you asked my colleagues about the caseload. Caseload for complaints about pharmacy coming to us is not notable for, the, for its absence as complaints about as advice. Um, and in a way, I think that tells us something about public expectations of what pharmacy is there for, and, a, and a, perhaps an underappreciation a under of the safety role and the value that pharmacy can add. So I think part of how we can how we can help to support the work that you're doing, for example, is in relation to that agenda of raising the profile and also raising expectations so that uh, members of the public look to pharmacists and their teams for advice. We still receive complaints from patients, for example, who, who are agreed to being asked questions by, pharma by pharmacists, and that tells us something about the level of that expectation in some cases. So I think there's a, there is some work to do in relation to that. Thank you very much. Yes. I could give you a lecture on pharmacy, and particularly pharmacists prescribing, but I don't think I'm going to do it right now. Maybe you could do that on another occasion. <laughs> no. No, right. No, thank you. No. Um, so is there anything you particularly want us to take away from today? And we have suggested that if there are other things that you think we ought to have asked about or there are holes in the questions that we've asked, um, please come back to us because we are open and accessible. But can I ask you um, in turn uh, if there's anything in particular you want us to take away from today? No, I think we're more than happy to supply the additional information you've requested. Um, Apologise we haven't got that available to you today, but um, we will certainly provide it to you. Right, thank you very much. I think no. Nothing further from me, thank you. All right, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.